Welcome to the 2020 NGC Boca Slip Fest, our first festival in an entirely virtual and online format. Um, everyone is, I'm sure you've been hearing people saying about, you know, we're in unprecedented times, but this may be probably one of the few things of these unprecedented times that I quite welcome, which is the ability to have so many more people hear about Caribbean literature and hear about work from these amazing writers wherever you are in the world. So I'm going to welcome you to Tales of the Islands, new fiction by Monique Roffey and Jacob Ross, two Caribbean writers, Caribbean British writers. We'll talk about how, you know, how that <laughs> works and how you feel about that also a bit later. And so thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world, whether you're in your living room, in your bedroom, on your front porch, if it's still daylight where you are. Thank you for being here with us. And thank you very much to Jacob and Monique for being here and taking time out to chat. Neither of you are any stranger. Oh, before I say that, I want to remind you all of our hashtags. If you're following along and you want to tweet or you want to do any social media from, um, from this session, our hashtags are Bocas2020 or Bocas at 10. So feel free to use the hashtags and follow along and tweet up a storm and Facebook up a storm and Instagram up a storm about these two wonderful books we're going to talk about today. You would have seen them on the screen already. Mermaid of Black Conch by Monique Roffey and Black Rain Falling by Jacob Ross. I'm going to introduce both writers very briefly because they're no stranger to the Bocas stage. Monique Roffey was born in Port of Spain, Trinidad, and has lived most of her time in the UK back and forth. She's the author of six novels and a memoir and has been shortlisted for, and this is a long list, the Orange Prize, the Orion Award, the Anko Award, the Costa Fiction Award, and has been longlisted for the OCM Bocas Award. Her novel Archipelago also won the OCM Bocas Award for Caribbean Literature in 2013. Four of her novels are set in Trinidad and the Caribbean region. They are Archipelago, The White Woman on the Green Bicycle, House of Ashes, and her current novel that we're going to talk about today, The Mermaid of Black Conch. Jacob Ross is a Grenadian-born writer living in the UK. He is the associate fiction editor at People Tree Press, the author of several story collections and the editor of five short story anthologies. His first novel, Prince Bender, was shortlisted for 2009's Commonwealth Writers Prize and the Society of Authors Best First Novel. His 2016 novel, The Bone Readers, which is the first of the quartets, the Kamaho Quartet, won the inaugural Jalak Prize and was shortlisted for the Association of the Caribbean Writers Award. Black Rain Falling is the book two in this quartet and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So having said that, without further ado, <clears throat> welcome guys. Um, I'm going to ask both of you to read for five minutes from uh, both novels and then we'll get into a nice chat. So Monique, if you'd like to start. Oh, thank you. Thank okay. you, Ayala, for such a wonderful introduction. Okay. Um, it's funny about reading because um, I've been sitting here deciding what I think I should read and then it just became really clear to me because there are some really exciting fighting catch scenes to read from and, da, 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 and I've read from them before and I thought to myself no I'm going to read so this book is written <clears throat> in an omniscient narrator it's also written in an in, in epistolary form which is like letters looking back retrospectively <coughs> and then we have snippets of the mermaid talking in this newfound language that she has 
And initially, when I started to um, write this book, I just wanted to write the book from the point of view of a mermaid. And because I was so impressed with Robert Antoni's book, Davina Trace, where he uses this kind of monkey language, I just wanted to write from the point of view of a mermaid. And my good friend, Anthony Joseph, persuaded me not to, and he was right. But I think I'm just going to read a very, very, very short piece from her voice. And it was such an experiment because I'm not a poet. <coughs> and it's a bit of, you know, it's kind of blurring the lines here. But this is the first time we hear from the mermaid, Aikaia. I disappeared one night in a big storm long, long ago. Island once where Taino people live. And the people before Taino, north in this pattern of islands and west too, the island I remember was shaped like a lizard. I have seen the sea and I have seen its glory. I have seen its power and the power of its kingdom. I have swum its angers and I have swum its misery. I have swum its velvet floor, the corals, the cities underneath. I have swum under islands. I have swum close to the shore in shallow waves and seen children playing. I have swum with a slow steel canoa. I have swum everywhere in this archipelago. I have swum with large pod of dolphin. I have swum with shoal of fish, big like the size of one whole human being. I have dived into walls of ocean. I would have dead very soon as woman. 40 cycles, children, husband, life of land and life of birth and death. Instead, I live for more than a thousand cycles inside the sea. I was not alone at the time of my cursing. An old woman also cursed and she disappeared too the same night. Long, 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 so long. I don't know the time, only that they called up a hurricane to take me far away and seal up my legs inside a tail. That's it. That's all I'm going to read for now. <laughs> That's me done. Thank you very much, Monique, for that. That was very moving, amazing. Um, Jacob, would you like to go ahead? Tell us a little bit about, um, as Monique did, tell us a little bit about the novel and then go into reading. Jacob, you have to unmute your... Mute, okay, sorry. Ah, there you yeah. are. Right. Yeah, I, I decided to, to, to write um, this crime series because um, looking around, I didn't see uh, many writers doing this kind of writing, genre writing, which focuses on crime. Uh, and I was particularly um, concerned to write these kinds of books because crime features so fundamentally in Caribbean life, especially these days, there are writers who write about crime. Uh, and I can name quite a few of them. But in terms of the genre, I, I didn't see much coming out there um, from from the region. And I thought that, well, you know, the French Caribbean islands have their crime writers. Uh, Cuba has its crime writer, the Spanish. Um, why not the Anglo-Caribbean? So this is one of the reasons why I sat down and decided to, to study the under structure and to uh, attempt this book, which uh, has turned out, which has turned out to be the way it has turned out this particular series. Uh, there are many big questions which I address in my writing uh, about Caribbean society. And I'm sure they're going to come up, some of them are going to come up in the um, discussion we're going to be having later on. But this year concerns a red incident that I experienced when I was um, in Grenada two years ago, um, when a woman was run over by a policeman driving a minibus, his minibus, and um, he didn't stop the bus. And was a terrible, terrible death 
And in this particular scene, the she, the detective, the main, the protagonist of the novel, he witnesses it, which he didn't in real life, of course, and he arrests the police officer. And to arrest the police officer, another police <laughs> arresting a, a police officer, arresting another police officer, that's asking for trouble. Yeah. Anyway, um, he, got, he gets called in to work and he's taking his time because he's very, very upset about it. Uh, because the police officer who ran over the woman said he thought it was a dog, so he didn't stop. So he got arrested by Digger, and he, Digger threw him in jail and, um, and took the keys home. So this is where he is returning to the office now. The whole, the whole department was there when I walked in, clearly waiting for me. Detective Superintendent Chillman sat near the door, his elbows on his knees, his mouth twisted in a tight and worried knot. The two office, office admins, Pet and Lisa, were side by side, the desks facing the door. Chief Officer Marlon had wheeled his chair out of his office. He sat straight back in a pressed blue shirt, following my movement with steady, vicious eyes. An officer in uniform was on a chair next to him. Miss Tanis Laws, in a beautiful sea green dress, looked relaxed at her desk, her gaze directed through the window at the marketplace below. And for a moment, she rested those big brown eyes on my face, then turned back to the window. What takes you so long, Madan greeted. I lifted my shoulders and dropped them, pulled the chair and sat down. What's the upset, I said. The chief officer exploded. What do you mean, what's the upset? That's the best you could do? You lock up an officer, you take the key and you walk, and you're asking what the upset is? Well, what makes Officer Busu different from any other person out there in Kamaho? Because you can't go arresting officers just so. You're, bring, you're, bring, you're doing the same blasted job. Marlon, you're shouting, chill. He didn't answer my question. Answer it. He shot to his feet, pushed out a hand. Give me the keys. No, not yet. And get out of my face, Marlon. Yes, Chilman cleared his throat, a wet, threatening sound. Marlon retreated. Miss Tanis Laws turned from the window to take us in with an irritated, sidewise look. Answer my question, I said. Were you ever here about police arresting police? It's the same force. You want to start a civil war? A flush of anger ran through me. A police officer, stinking drunk and driving, Run into a woman on the road on the roadside. Woman went to buy some milk for her two children. The youngest child is two years old. The other one is six. After I lost control of the vehicle and hit her. He so drunk he said he thought it was a dog. Didn't stop for half a mile. Recovery had to scrape her off the road. Put yourself in my place, Marlon. Why you would have done? Why you didn't take him aside? For what? Enough of this, Miss Anastasia's voice voice cut through. She pulled her hand back plucked the tissue and began to find her face. I still say he deserves a different treatment, Marlon said. Not from me, I said. I'll stop here. Okay. Thank you very much. Two very, very, oh, two very, very different, Fabulous. different readings. And um, I'm going to draw two questions. My first two questions are going to be sort of very much related to so what you've just read, um, the first thing obviously that I think about is, 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 as you mentioned earlier, Jacob, that there weren't a lot of people writing crime fiction about the Caribbean. And Monique, obviously, I think when people hear Mermaid, there's so many sort of references to choose from, from sort of fantasy, magical realism. And I just wondered about both of your relationships to the, the genres of, of, um, of your books that are sometimes seen as unfairly seen, I think, as sort of crime has a way that you write a crime novel. Fantasy has a way you write a fantasy novel. But neither of your novels are totally, totally wedded to those conventions. So I wondered if you talk a little bit about the ways that you, you know, make those genres or those conventions fresh um, with your work, or if that's a deliberate thing that you wanted to attack or kind of come in at a side with. Okay, Monique, you want to go first? Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for being. Yes, okay, I will. Well, you see, I don't necessarily think this is um, 
You see, I think it's more in the line of Caribbean magical realism to the 10th mm -hmm. degree. So it, it, so when we were, you know, so one editor who looked at it said, you know, listen, it's off the scale, you know, in terms of what you're asking the readers to swallow. And I, it is off the scale. I mean, it's about a mermaid. You're either going to, you just, you just, you just don't, even, it. you're not even going to buy it, you know. So I don't really see it as a fantasy novel. Um, I see it as Caribbean magical realism, to be honest, ramped up, ramped, really ramped up. And um, there's a lot I could probably, I'm doing this uh, panel for Brooklyn Caribbean Festival about folklore, mm -hmm. but I'm using the archetype of um, a cursed uh, woman from the sea. There's a lot there. And as I've been writing this and since I've published it, I mean, mermaids are, everywhere they are everywhere all over the world everywhere every ocean every river they are everywhere in our collective unconscious so i'm much more interested in using archetypes and rewriting a myth that needed a good feminist update in my opinion and um and really stretching the reader in terms of of what they're willing to sort of like go are they are you going to come with me on this you're going to come with me here so really, yeah, I don't think it's a fantasy novel. I think it's a li it's literary fiction, and but it's 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 hyper weird. Yeah, that yeah, that's what I would say. In yeah, my I agree. To your I agree. I, I think it's um I think it's a way to go, and I'm, more and more now I see Caribbean writers, uh, you know, working as an editor who mm. received a lot of Caribbean fiction, uh, and not only the ones that come in, uh, beginning to write from a different epistemology. And by this, I mean drawing very heavily and very deeply in a thoughtful way on Caribbean reality, Caribbean culture, Caribbean folk narratives, the Caribbean system of beliefs. And when I remember when I first saw your manuscript, because, you know, People Free Press published it and that's where I was and stuff, I was really struck by what you were doing, Monique. I thought it was a very, was a remarkable reworking of a, a universal trope but has, that has resonances in the Caribbean. You know, um, in the Eastern Caribbean, we have Mani Water. Mani Water is a mermaid mm -hmm. figure. Mm -hmm. Within the Yoruba, the kind of um, Santeria, Shango, yes. uh, you know, religion, we have, um, we have Yemaya. Uh, we have Oshun, mm -hmm. you know, and these are, you know, Orishas mm -hmm. of the waters, of the sweet mm -hmm. waters. We have, we have um, Orokun. So mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, I was really struck by, by, by what you were drawing on and which I, more and more, as I continue to, to, to think about fiction and thinking about, in a way, uh, I, I've heard a, a lovely talk a lot, there's passion about that, but at the time I didn't know what the hell he meant, you know, but <laughs> I have begun now to, to get a deeper sense of what he's doing. I think you're doing that. Um, and I can name quite a few other writers now who are drawing on those deep, profound kind of tropes that mm. are also part of the Caribbean cosmo you know, cosmosophy or cosmology, whatever way you choose to call it. But with, with regard to me and my, uh, my book, my book, there are a couple of people. I have a very good friend who, who is a crime writer, and he's quite he's a very successful crime writer in this country. And then I give it to him. He said, "This is not a this is not a crime novel. You can not a crime. It's not about a crime, you know, um, right. because he, he saw later on he kind of recanted because you know for a whole range of reasons and stuff. But I did sort of threaten him and said, "You don't dare go out there and tell people that I'm writing a book about a crime. It's a bloody crime novel." But the, the, what I'm trying to say here is. <laughs> As a writer, I knew that I couldn't do what I saw happening with the manuscripts that come in, the crime novels which come into people's free press. All they've done, these writers, and I'm sorry to say this, but it's true, they've sent in books where they're taking a Raymond Chandler character like Philip Marlowe and they've painted right. him black. Yeah? Mm -hmm. they, they, in, a, in other words, what they have done is creolized. Not even creolized, because that's a process. What they've done is they've blackened the white right. metropolitan urban character and please them in Trinidad, because you get a lot from Trinidad in particular. And that is what that makes no sense to me. 
um, what I had to do was to completely rethink the crime novel. So, and undermine, the book is, a, is full of subversions. For example, we have um, my main detective, a character, that's yeah. bigger. Yes, yeah, he is male, but he has very, very strong womanist views based on mm -hmm. his experience of what happened to him. He was brought up by a woman. In the kind of masculinist tradition, you know, you have your hero like Philip Marlowe or whichever one you want to choose. He walks in and he starts beating people up and he gets very physical and he's macho mm -hmm. and he's women and, you know, he calls women abroad and all of that. I just did not want to do that. My character, Digger, he cries. But have you ever heard of a detective crying, you know, mm -hmm. because, he, you know, he, one of them, he, he actually witnesses that crime. He's terrified of becoming desensitized to, you know, to, to people dying. And he says mm -hmm. to his father, I mean, and, and also Miss Tanis thought herself, she's no sidekick, she's his partner. Well, can, I, in, can, I, yeah. can I interject? Mm -hmm. I yes. love Miss Stanislaus. <laughs> I've read the first yeah. book and yeah. I just think she steals the book. It's, <laughs> well, she she's does. not a cameo, um, she's not a sidekick. Yeah, exactly, she, exactly. At the heart of at the heart of your work is she's great. Exactly. And she's extremely and, and, feminine, which I find is so interesting in a lot yeah. of um these notions of there's always a hard as nails woman yeah. who's sort of almost de-sexed. Whereas yeah. Miss Stanislaus is colorful, she loves her dresses, but she's a yeah. sharp shooter. And I think exactly. that's... She's I, I love what you said about she took her tissue out of her handbag. <laughs> Miss Stanislav has a handbag. Yes. And it's like, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, of course. And she, she's very, she, as you said, she's very, she's very feminine. <laughs> but, but you don't mess with her, you know? And, and, a, and, and a lot of men, in the first book, there's like an instance where, where she arrested a guy, the coconut man, they call him. And coconut man decided he doesn't want a woman to arrest him, you know? <laughs> and, you know, for him, he doesn't mind being taken to jail, but a woman arrested me, we understand. Mm. And, then, and a nice looking woman like Miss Stannis lost the book. And a nice looking <laughs> woman like Miss Stannis lost, you know? And also, um, you know, you have. So, so and what I decided to do in writing the book was to, have, to give her equal agency, you know, as Digger. And at times when she leads the case, she leads the investigation. I was totally surprised that the book resonated so strongly um, with, with so many readers. Uh, I mean, the book was published first by a People's Free Press, which is a small independent publisher. And it was taken up by, by, by this, one of the, lead, the big crime fiction publishers in this country. And you look at the reviews, you see, but I decided to literally turn everything on its head and to actually make right. the book a Caribbean crime novel, you mm. know, and there is going to be action. But, and it's a society, as we know, Caribbean society, sorry, those of you who might be listening to this, is extremely toxic at some level, especially to do with masculinity, the ideas of what it means to be a man, the, the whole the way men deal with women, the kind of casual, the careless violence that we have, mm. not only physical violence. So, and I decided that I was, and also, we do live in profoundly corrupt societies. It's the same here in England, too. I mm. mean, you know, when I'm writing about England, my business is, is the Caribbean. That's where I'm right. from, and that's where my heart is. So, in many ways, what I was doing there was literally... I, I deconstructed the, the crime novel, mm -hmm. the understructure of it, what are they doing with characters and characters, and, and I said, I'm just going to go a completely different go way with it. And, and I'm, both you, know, you I'm, sort of have said that, that you sort of decided, you know what, I'm going, if I'm going to do this, I might as well yeah. go full full 100, exactly. you know? And, you, know you, and, both, yeah. you both said something that, um, it, 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 I was going to ask a different question, but your, your response is led. Um, to a different direction. I, what I, one of the things that I thought about with both um, with both books is how much they present an alternative way of knowing. And let me explain what I mean about that. You know, a crime novel is about facts. It's about procedure, traditionally. Facts, procedure, evidence, clues, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's how you get to the heart of the truth of anything. Um, uh, 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 and we already said that this is not a fantasy novel and it's a magical realism novel, it's a literary novel, but it also presents 
a whole different way of, of knowing and understanding the events that sort of have shaped the Caribbean. In this case, you've taken a mermaid who is crafted from an indigenous woman who has been transported through time, through space, and is mm. now living in the same, in a, in a sense, the same Caribbean, but an entirely different Caribbean. Mm. So mm. I just wondered if you could both sort of talk a little bit about the ways that, um, that like for instance, Jacob with, with, um, with Black Rain Falling, as much as this is a crime novel and they have to collect clues and evidence that, you know, there are the woman in Kara Island who presents an entirely different way of knowing things. Ms. Stanislas has an entirely different way of knowing things and solving things. Um, so yeah. maybe if you could talk about that a little bit and, and Monique, talk a little bit about how you present or deconstruct space and time to present a different way, perhaps, of understanding the Caribbean region. It's a long okay. question, but let's okay. see. Okay, I'm happy to go. Okay, so um, I definitely, in order to pull this off time-wise, mm -hmm. Mermaid, I wanted her to uh, re-emerge in modern, in the modern, t in modern times, mm -hmm. but not today. Because if anybody caught a mermaid today, it would go viral in the social media. Right. Da -da -da -da. So it had to be before the turn of the century. I thought to myself. So I like the 70s. The 70s in, in, the, in the region is a time of political upheaval, mm -hmm. of nation building, of black power, revolution, feminism, ting ting. All of this is like happening in the region. So it's bubbling. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, it's a feminist novel. And so if she was going to appear at any time, I thought, OK, the 1970s. Would be so that already thing. gives me when, when. I want mm. this mermaid to appear. So nobody is going to take a photograph of her that is going to end up on the newspaper and everybody is going right. to be drunk. Everybody's going to be drunk. <laughs> They're all going to get so drunk. The only people who see the friggin' mermaid are these drunk men and then she disappears. So nobody's going to and remember. no one knows she's even there. There, mm -hmm. she just gets, she's up one day, She they lynch her and then the next day she's gone and two weeks later they all moved on and nobody's hiding no damn mermaid in this <laughs> small village. But the right. other thing is, is that she she is a first person. She comes from our ancestral, our, you know, these are from the Taino people. It's a Taino legend. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, there's a big question is how would we take care of somebody like that? Mm -hmm. How could we connect with, you know, the region, the region before Columbus, before the conquistadores, mm -hmm. before the germs, the warfare, the barbarity, the, the killing, the mass genocides that took place, slavery, all of this, before it all happened, how would we take care of the, of the people who are very civilized people? Mm. And what would she think? How, you know, it just, what if, what if was the big thing, you know? Mm -hmm. how, what if, what, you know, she wouldn't know about, about slavery because she mm -hmm. would have been dead a long time before then. So she's like, what the fuck is, what's happened? Why is everybody mm -hmm. black? And mm -hmm. where are all my yes. people? And, and mm -hmm. what happened? And who who are you? And and where is everybody? But she also has a shamanic, um, like she reads the skies. She can speak mm -hmm. to the trees. She's got a very quiet understanding of how everything works. She's a completely different type of human being. And for a writer, that is like, whoa, I get to mm -hmm. write. I get to imagine. I get to mm -hmm. like let myself off the leash and try and imagine what it might be like for somebody who had strong connection to nature, completely different understanding, no language. So she's disremembered. Nobody really knows what that they spoke, the dialects. It's all been forgotten. Mm -hmm. she's forgotten it. She's trying to, and then I'm setting her up. I had a big stumbling block with the fact that there's a white woman who is going to be reintroducing her to language but there's also yes. a deaf boy who's reintroducing her to sign language so she's acquiring language i mean i just had a ball with it really because you, you, you so really have, you have to gift that to yourself you have to really mm -hmm. really really want to write and enjoy and like what you're doing and get lost mm -hmm. in it and then explore all these possibilities the other thing i don't know if you're going to ask us about it was yeah. with um place i don't know whether that might be another question yes. But go, okay. go ahead. Go well, well, just place-wise, um, Black Conch, 
somewhere I found out it's another name for Tobago. But um, but I spend a lot of time in Grand Riviere as well as in Charlotteville. And so it's kind of, again, there was, as you know, Ayana, there were these um, magical people called the Earth People who mm, used to live. Yes. You know who mm. I mean, don't you? Yes. And mm -hmm. They used to live in Grand Riviere. Um, and every in, now and again, there'd be some sighting of them sort of come down and come into the village. Or come into, and yes. Mm -hmm. Like like Juve. And, and, um, mm. and they had a matriarch called Mother Earth and she mm -hmm. got cancer and they were like extreme rasters who were naked in the bush and... And they're all called things like life and nicer country and breadfruit and pepper mm. and Jakatan and Lakatan. So that's things. where the names came that's from. That's where they mm. all come from. It's like I don't in the in Trinidad, in the Caribbean, you don't have to make anything up. It's all <laughs> there. You don't have to make a thing up. It's all you just have to look. So and I think that's sort of the the heart of what I was um what I'm interested in with both of these books, that they present an entirely different perspective of knowing what is real what's not real who decides this is the facts or who decides exactly. that this is the true thing mm -hmm. exactly I, I do I, I wonder, am... sorry i just want to ask to jo um jacob as well i i i'm conscious that i have a double consciousness mm -hmm. so that the, the split between being diaspora and trinidadian and british i wonder whether that is where this different knowing comes from the double mm. lens another lens that's all <laughs> Yeah, the, the, in a way, I was touching on that earlier on. Um, one of the great cons of history and one of the great fallouts of the experience of empire is this whole idea. In other words, the part of the curriculum of empire has been to convince those of us who have been colonized that there is only one way of knowing. There's mm -hmm. only one way of understanding. And one of, my, one of the things I say to people when they give me that kind of bullshit, I say, well, okay, if you knew so much and you're so accurate, why, and you having had to curate the world over the past 400 years, why are we in so much shit at we the moment? <laughs> right? why, why are you messing it up? Do you call that success? But that, that is another kind of narrative. So, so you have the character like um, Bena, the woman that, that they are meet on Kara Isle. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a wonderful phrase that Peter Kalu um, used to kind of explain it. He, call, he calls it, for example, they don't have any scientific way of locating a dead body, but they have a way of locating a dead body, right? Mm -hmm. And he calls it affective cartography, yeah? And in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean, uh, for example, I'm a twin. I always know when my twin. Yeah, I always no, I know. Yeah, I, but you know, we're very, we're very different. But I always know when my twin brother is very ill. You know, uh -huh. when or when he and he always knows when I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, we hardly speak. He's in the British Virgin Islands, right? And that and that's you know amazing. What? That's magical realism. That's, that's magical. Magic. Yeah. In, 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 yeah. yeah. But the fact is that these are realities that exist. Um, these, these are truths that are there and that we know, but we have, in a way, been educated to think that it's not scientific, therefore it's not true. Mm -hmm. And it becomes true, it becomes true only when people from the metropolitan centers of the world say it's true, mm -hmm. you understand? And that's what I'm talking about. I mean, um, I was very interested in, in, in Monique's, um, the premise of Monique's book, The Mermaid of Black Kong. Because I did a sim, I kind of I had a similar kind of question for one of the short stories I wrote quite a few years ago. I think it's in my last collection, and it's mm. called um, it's called uh, a way to catch the dust, you know. And it's basically mm. based on this idea of the zone, the ship, um. you know, that, you, that dumped all of these um, these yeah. Africans into the sea and went back to claim the insurance. And I asked myself a very simple question. What happens if one of these characters, let's say it's a girl yes. for a whole what happens if she, I don't know, the Cubans have a metaphor which is very powerful when they talk about, when they want to explain um, the, 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 the devastation of the Atlantic slave trade. Because so many people were thrown aboard, the, the, the Cubans say that there is a road of bones beneath the sea mm -hmm. that leads from Europe all the way 
to the Americas. So what happens if one of the characters, a young girl, is thrown into this, you know, she's dumped, and she walks on this road of bones and emerges 400 years later in the mm-hmm. Caribbean and met by those of us who have lived there and grown and evolved wow. there. How would we receive her? That's at the heart of the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and then another thing I wanted to, ca- to point very out like is... What, that's very like what I was... It's the same thing. It's the same thing. How would we take care of this, these... These were these people from our from our past. Yeah, exactly. In other words, how past? How would we how would we care for them? Contemporary Caribbeans. How do we confront our if our history materializes in front of us? That those of us who want to know anything about it. And in other words, and how has that kind of myopia, that that willful myopia, um, got in the way of a kind of self understanding? And who is it among us that? Deprive ourselves of this, um, the, of this kind of understanding of self, or because I know that the banners of the world, that the character in the Born Readers, yes, she knows who she is. She has a very profound sense of herself and her place in the world, you know, and and that is what my character Digger has to learn. So yes, I asked very, mm-hmm. very, 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 very big question. Um, and yeah, and I, I saw that in your, I saw the premise of your book, and I say, yeah, that's that's a very interesting question mm-hmm. that. You know, that a story question that you were asking in your novel, which is one of the things that attracted me to your book. Because sometimes you and I kind of synchronize without realizing it. It's when I look at your work, I say, how oh, many? Yeah, she's doing, yeah, asking the but same really kind of question. Can I just say the fundamental question, though? If, us, yeah. if you ask something, if our past walked onto the sea and came to greet us, how would yeah. we how would we treat it? How would we respond? And, and Monique, yeah. what I find interesting about that, you've arrayed the characters that you've chosen to be yes. this mermaid's protectors or champions in a way. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, a fisherman who is sort of a little bit not, he's not the, he's not a bajon masculine um, trope of, of, of the sort of stereotypical Caribbean man, very much like how Digger isn't. Um, there is, you know, the, the, the father who abandoned his child and you know for you know for, for a lot of other reasons but you know it comes back um there is the white woman who is the inheritor of uh of all of this land and who has made very conscious decisions in and i don't want to have too many spoilers but she's made conscious decisions for how she's going to deal or how she has dealt with that and a boy who can't speak and yeah. so I, i'm wondering uh-huh. what have what what are, what are what are you this sort of points away who are the people that are most yeah, poised yeah. to provide some sort of redemptive um um path to us dealing with our history you're all looking you're looking at four semi-marginalized um characters and i thought that was a quite an interesting an interesting choice there oh god you're a good questioner um, <laughs> I can I can tell you I can tell you that the white woman is um, based on two people that I know who are both <clears throat> landowners and who are I would say benevolent and part of things and very much one of them is very much the remnants mm-hmm. of the plant the plantocracy mm-hmm. but also an environmentalist and a feminist. And a, and, a, and a bad, you know, she's a badass, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I don't know who she is, I'm not calling names. Mm-hmm. And something to do with wanting to take the white woman who traditionally has a, is, a, has this history of being crazy and mad and bad and, you know, all these things that I just think, can we put that aside? I'm not saying it's a wrong trope, but I did want to, you know, I do write about white people I write about white Caribbean people. I'm not interested in white English people. I'm always fascinated about white Caribbean people and who they are. So I wanted to take the de-stereotype the white woman and see if she's going to be able to live. And then um, the deaf character, I have hearing loss. I I suffer from hearing loss. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I know what it's like to be, I I can write that. That's going to work for me. And, and, um, He's a poet. I like, I, you know, he's a deaf. But um, the the men. I mean, I mean, like Jacob. I'm, I um, mm-hmm. I I think there needs to be a lot of writing around Caribbean masculinity. And um, 
I feel as though I really hope, I mean, I'm writing about black men. I mean, I'm a white woman. I mean, you know, I, I was expecting to get like completely shot down and shredded up, but I, I went there and I wanted these men to be good. I wanted them to be lovers. I wanted them to be, I think um, life is a man, life is a man. And David mm. is a, a, a boy. He's, a, he's a, the immature masculine who mm. like I, uh, it has a massive impact on him and, and vice versa. So the feminist rewriters is that <clears throat> the curse, she's cursed. There's a jealousy thing going on and she doesn't get to have her erotic rite of passage. She doesn't get to be, she's stuck with her sexuality sealed up. She's a virgin mm -hmm. for life. That's the curse. She's banished. Mm -hmm. And David gives her the rite of passage. They come together. She, he, she springs, he springs her into her full womanhood. But in return, he is never the same. You know, he has never met anyone like this person. He's completely dazzled by her. And so I, I wanted to give her a good little clutch of friends who mm -hmm. she can rely on. And, um, and I had such fun with it all, you know, when he, with the, with the, the policeman, Porthos John, and the, oh, getting gosh. kidnapped and sprung mm -hmm. and the SWAT fatigues mm -hmm. and the broken down Jeep and the, the police mm -hmm. cell. I had such fun. I mean, you have to, in the end, you just have to go, you know what, fuck it. I'm, I, I'm, this is good. This is what I want to do. Yeah, she needed a good clutch of friends. I thought she needed the right. And I and Priscilla, mm -hmm. you know, Priscilla is every everybody knows a Priscilla. Everybody. Oh, I love that character. Somebody <laughs> who is like real bad, and she can mm -hmm. really fuck things up for everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, when really you need one villain, you know, both in both novels, as much as it, and it actually just this just occurs to me that um, there is a there is a crime also at the center of, of your novel, Monique, or the, mm. the, there's, it, there's literally the, the, the taking of this woman from the sea, the attempts to, to sell her, who owns her body, who has control yeah. over her, who doesn't. And then there's, as you said, the sort of springing, the springing her from her captivity sort of at the end. Um, and in, in different ways, and I want, to, I want us to go there, both novels also look at the way that crime is very, very, very linked to privilege, skin color yeah. privilege, wealth, who gets to who gets to get away with crime, yeah, <laughs> who's not exactly. seen as a criminal yeah. because of, you yeah. know. So I wanted yeah. to talk about that a little bit, how you've handled that in your novel, Jacob. Um, I was very interested in um, almost without thinking too much about in what I call the chromatics of the novel. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm writing about a small Eastern, Ca Eastern Caribbean country, and I think that Trinidad has, and perhaps Jamaica to a certain extent, that that sort of um, the colorism we talk we, we talk about, that sort of conflation of wealth and privilege with you know the descendants of of, of Europeans, that's undeniable. It's there. So if if, if you look at um, the, like the Luther Kane character in my book, yes. you know. Um, who, you know, I refer to the Caucasian Negro because he has mm -hmm. black blood. You never accept anybody telling him that, you know, but, it, but Digger sees that in him, but Digger detests him. And Digger's father, interestingly enough, mm -hmm. is from the upper class. Too. Similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, Luther King, he will get away with murder. And he almost got away with murder precisely because of his, his, his um, you know, where does the Jewish, mm -hmm. judiciary come? You know, and the, and the whole the whole um, the whole issue of policing and the criminalizing of of of, of, of the, in, the kind of amplification um, of of sentences for 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 the small petty criminal and uh, right. uh, you know, it's all there it's all there in the it's all there of course in the narrative but I come up it's very there are two, two things which I find difficult to avoid when I write. Um, a novel set in the Caribbean. One is class. The, uh, the other one is policing. Right? Mm -hmm. um, for me, for me, in other words, authority. Right? And now mm -hmm. I think corruption has become quite, quite um, an important element um, in Caribbean society. Now, I'll just make, um, give you a quick example. I have always been struck 
when I go to the Caribbean, I'm not just the Caribbean, but largely when I go to the Caribbean, I'm struck by how the extent to which crime has not only impacted on the society in terms of people's fears and people, the sense of insecurity that women and you know men also feel, um, but the, the extent to which the very architecture of buildings are built with crime in mind. Mm -hmm. So for example, the average house of somebody with a little bit of money or a lot of money, you know, it's got grilled windows, iron grilled mm -hmm. on the window. Mm -hmm. uh, and people literally lock themselves. The, the phenomenon yeah, of yeah. greater community in the Caribbean now, you know, sprung up, mm. um, you know, exponentially within within the past. And, and, and people are armed, and they have big guard dogs. Oh I mean, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. they, have they have big dogs and all of that. Yeah. And so I do think that we're missing a trick if we do not address. You know, there are big themes in in literary fiction that you know we've addressed from time even from the 1950s and even beyond mm. you know we've you know history and all that kind of stuff but i do think that the crime novel by its very nature is perfectly placed it is so contemporaneous it is so dynamic it is so mm -hmm. relevant and it is so articulate the articulacy you have with a crime novel you just don't have easily or readily with Otherwise. a literary novel mm -hmm. because you know, a reader accepts that the writer is going to look at the underbelly of society, almost the way, um, the way um, a, a journalist will do, you know, right. and that they expect that kind of digging. And we have, I think it's important, and it raises big questions, which we are confronted with, for example, the distinction between justice and legality. Sometimes the law doesn't work in favor of justice. You, 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 yes. you know, and, and I tend to look at that rather closely. Quite often the law is in favor of the people who, who have, have power, who are in power usually. Um, and just to stick up in, Jacob, this is the thing that I think that is so, um, so clear in your novel as a distinctly different sort of crime novel. Yes. None of the solutions that actually are uh, the, within the way the plot is resolved are rights or no. legal <laughs> or, or moral. Yes, exactly. Trust, exactly. But, mm -hmm. Exactly. There's a scene in the book which I'm very proud of. It's when Miss Alice Lord confronts the man who raped her. Oh boy. Do you remember that scene? Oh, and boy. and there was a moment of reality. I wouldn't tell you, but I wouldn't give it away. A moment of realization um, from Digger, you know, and he realized that all that sort of stuff, you know, was was leading inevitably to her confronting this man, mm -hmm. you know, and and I, I, you know, it's probably one of the, it is one of the strongest scenes in the book, but I have not met anybody who has read that, you know, not well spoken to me about it and not mentioned that particular scene. Mm -hmm. Now that is justice. It's a kind of justice. Any woman would understand that. Yeah. You know, her life being mm -hmm. so profoundly damaged. Yeah. But the law will not understand that. And the book yeah. is about that. The law, the law says that a police officer, um, you know, should arrest yes. a person should be treated who in this a crime and bring them in for, 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 you know, to be sentenced by a, fucking, by a judge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just not happening. With, and very in, much like in, in your novel, Monique, there is. Technically, these mm. two men have have a permit. There's a they make a very big deal about they have a permit yeah, to carry to... what they caught. <laughs> and this person has stolen their property. Doesn't matter that their property yeah. is a is a is a human being. Yeah, Doesn't well, matter that their she, property she, has yeah, I love that. I love that. I think it was powerful um, for me. That was powerful. What do you see? What I think I'm because I now 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 know what I did which is I think if you have a mermaid and she is an archetype that is embedded in our unconscious, mm -hmm. she is a big metaphor that does a hell of a lot of work for me. Everybody knows she's other. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows she's cursed and tragic. I don't have to explain that shit to, to, the, to the reader. Mm -hmm. So she's already somebody we're rooting for because she's seriously, seriously 
you know, she's transgender yeah. or mm. is she is she non-binary? Uh, she's definitely been cursed. How long is that going to last? All this sort of stuff. Mm. But um, something. God, what was I going to ask the question? What was I? What was mm. I saying? Where Where was I going with this? We were talking about the whole idea of what is just as opposed to what is legal. We were talking oh, yeah, about, yeah, yeah. about, about so, yeah, um, so violence she, against women. Okay, mm -hmm. so, yeah, okay. So what happens is, is when they first see her, I, mm. I often read the catch scene and she just jumps out of the sea and you can see her and it's a boatload of men. The first thing they think about is how much she's worth. Yeah. Millions. They, yeah. are, they are like, and, and this, this whole thing about, and then... And the, the Tobago boys or the, the black conch men are like, now nah, boy, boy, cut the line, put she back in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, nah, just, just cut that, put her back. But mm -hmm. eventually, even on the way back, because they hit her over the head, they bind her up and they, they get her back. Even on the way back, nicer country is thinking, you know, I wonder how much she's worth. How much she's and, worth. So, and so this thing about uh, corruption of, like, money corrupts. Money can corrupt anybody even though the black conch men are not proud of what they of, of catching this creature they all disappear they don't want to have anything to do with it mm -hmm. even they you know everybody wants a piece maybe she's worth millions and then priscilla is telling porthos you know look these stupid men from miami let's catch her we'll split the fine mm -hmm. she becomes commercialized she becomes she suddenly and i wanted it to basically to show how anyone could suddenly look at somebody um, as a viable financial, you know, this is a crime. It's a mm -hmm. crime. You know, and and like, like, like you've done, Jacob, is subvert things. I mean, how can yeah. I write something where a landowner, a white privileged landowner, is mm -hmm. a good guy, is springing mm -hmm. the yeah. from, she has the lover, yeah. lover, and because she, she gets, because she's part of things, she get horn real bad. She's, everybody mm -hmm. knows she get horn real bad. Mm -hmm. She's up there, you know, she has a deaf son. She's pretty isolated, run down. But Monique, let me just yeah. stick a pin. The thing I think that has made her, and I don't, this might be a spoiler, but I think we've gone into territories of spoilers mm -hmm. in many ways, that she has deliberately tried to divest her power. Mm -hmm. She has almost sort of sold off, not even sold off, you know, mm -hmm. the land. That, doesn't you know, collect she rent. said, hey, this is not my land. I live yeah, in this yeah. house. Yeah. But I don't own this space. Yeah. And I think that's part of what is what is able to make her a complex character, but also one that we can say, aha. Uh -huh. That's why I was saying that the novel, in some ways, both novels really are pointing to, okay, so this is Tales from the Islands as a panel, but what does this Caribbean future look like? What could it look like if we have sort of accepted or said, okay, these are islands that have been crafted by a set of economics that is about... Um, that is wasteful. Plantation economics is wasteful. We have yeah. these very abundant spaces described in both novels that have not been, that have been sort of divided up and used and worked in a wasteful way that is just to send yeah. money out, you yeah. know, and hasn't been about development and hasn't been about all of these things. Yeah. And so I think, I think that that, that, that choice yeah. that this character makes to say, you know what, I live here, we all have to live here, so we all must get some. One person mm -hmm. can't have all. Yeah. Is that important? Big... Listen, yeah. listen, I didn't make this up, but if you go up to up to northern Tobago, that's exactly what's gone on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't want to call names and things, but that is exactly what's up there. Yes, Jacob. Yes, yeah, sorry, Jacob. sorry. You no, know, it's my headphones. My headphones acting up. Okay. I, I think, I think, for me, um, when I read, when I read the book, what one of your book, Monique, one of the things that really struck me, um, it was if you like two conflicting ethics, two conflicting ways of of, of, of um, interfacing with with the world in a way, even though, we, and but we see through the made, which is the readiness with which these Americans, in particular, are prepared to monetize. A human yes. being, right? Yeah. That, that for me, that was one of the things that I found ra rather chilling about the book, I, about the, you know the, that particular trope in the book. The monitor, and of course, the others decide to fall in in line at a certain extent and start thinking about how much a human is. And 
for me, it dug up so many resonances in my head about, you know, the history of the Native Americans and whatever, 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 you know, the whole idea of monetizing. Um, and, you know, so I, I thought that that was a very, that, that was a, that, that was a, a very, very powerful, the word you use is metaphor, um, mm -hmm. in the book. Um, and why I think the book will actually last, you know, I think, I think personally, as I've said to you before, I think, it, I think it's your best book. I think so. That's my, you know, but that's a personal view. Um, you may have a different um, um, view of, of, about that. But getting back to, getting back to the societies we have inherited. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I had Chilman say that in Black Rain Falling. When, mm -hmm. when, when Chilman, when the Minister of Justice is doing everything that he could do to stop them, to block them, he wants to run the police force, even though you have a police commissioner. Mm -hmm. uh, and Chilman, Chilman explained that to, to, um, to Digger, and he says, basically, we are still on the plantation. <laughs> you know, it's a terrible thing to mm -hmm. say. But and Chilman says he's not really a minister; he's an overseer. He's an yes. overseer. I mean, yes. There are ways, there are ways in which we articulate and express power in the Caribbean that replicate the old ways of deploying mm -hmm. power. We may we, we may make it more sophisticated because we have sophisticated tools. But right. when you look the structures at the structures and part of it. These these systems are still in place, um, and I'm talking about um, we, we can. We, and when I go to Trinidad, which I love very much, I love. I have a great affinity for Trinidad and Van. I see that there. You see, you see it um, in terms of the kind of valorization of of gradations of color, the chromatics, you know, of the region. Mm -hmm. That is changing now, but mm -hmm. it is still very much the structures there. Are, are very much yeah. in place mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. these are things which even gene reese um was observing i am mm -hmm. um elements of white tiger to see people have no is this white tiger to see yes mm -hmm. the people i missed uh, you know when because she did, did address that in a very mm -hmm. very interesting way in, in in that novel but what i'm getting at here basically mm -hmm. is that the more i write about the caribbean the more i write about my Caribbean, our Caribbean, the more I, the more convinced I become of the necessity to step back and completely rethink the society and all and what the society is still premised on. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I think that our intellectuals, our, our thought producers need to sit back and again, Look at the world from which the mermaid comes, from right. which Anna comes. Yes. You know, that, that which is there, which is powerful, which is Latin Americans have done, like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and that, you know, they've mm -hmm. done a lot of work on that. That but is a very, Caribbean, very good um, mm -hmm. way for us to sort of, because I'm conscious now we're down to so much towards the end of our time that has gone so quickly. But I think that is such a wonderful way for us to start to wrap up. That this is the this is where we have to look towards. What is that yes. knowledge? What is that 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 sense of of the knowing and not knowing? That space sort of in between. I think. Um, I was hoping we would get to read a bit more, but I really think the time was very well spent talking yes. through a lot of these issues. I just have one question. I don't know if you might want to sort of lead off on that what's next are you are you writing another book are you deep in the midst of another project both of you um uh, but i know you have a yours is a quartet jacob I, so are. Mm -hmm. I have here this is my next project this is the treatment that i've spent a long ah. time working on of a crime novel <laughs> Interesting. Which I'm um, set in the East End and it's a cult. It's got a witch. I'm very, very comfortable in the land of, um, uh, you know, magic, basically. So, um, you know, the idea, like we've just been talking about, that, that crimes are solved all sorts of ways. There's layers and layers of injustice. All kind, I mean, London is an incredible place. If I drill down under my chair, 
10 feet, you know, I might find a Roman barge or, you know, yes, you know would. down there, dead people. Mm. There's hundreds of thousands of dead people um, yeah. under our feet, you know. Yeah, play, we're looking forward to hearing, play, to seeing play, that. Play, yeah, so it's, uh, and I just wanted to say, as me and Jacob have talked about it, mm. I, you know, I've written a lot and I thought it would be, um, oh, how much time do we have? Yes, we're done. Oh, we're, we're done. done. But yeah, I, just, I really want to tell yes. you about my next project. It's very yes, exciting please. for mm. me, at least. Yes. Um, my next novel is a literary novel, is a second in the Pint of Bender series, and it's called The Village Above the Wind. Now, and what I'm doing with that book, which I find exciting and which I'm hoping to get some response from, is completely getting rid of um, Western ideas of character, creating characters. And mm -hmm. I'm bringing a, a completely different approach to creating and constructing character. Um, and it's working. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, very exciting. It's working. <laughs> very you know, exciting it's working powerfully so for me. Damn. And when you read it, well, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way for us to end off. Thank you yeah. so much for staying with us. Uh, Thank you so much for yeah. tuning in. As I said, wherever you are, um, continue to follow along on the other events from the Bocas Litfest, the NGC Bocas Litfest. Follow along our hashtags, follow along on all our social media, and we hope to see you at the next session. Thank you so much to Monique and Jacob. Thank, Thank you. Wonderful Thank you, Diana. Wonderful, wonderful. I think, Diana. Diana. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. I think oh, you're, okay. you're, the, you're the bomb, you know? <laughs> I am. See you later. Okay.